When I need legal advice, I go to T. Scott Jones of Banks and Jones, who's nice enough to join us because from what I'm hearing, hello, counselor. How are you, sir? Oh, man, I'm tickled to death. Have the opportunity to be on the show after I saw the wildcat tears flow. Ah, so, there you that go. I like that. And by the way, thanks for the tickets to the Auburn game. My wife had a blast. Absolutely. Yeah, that, was a lot of, that was a lot of fun. I've been a lot of sporting events, but not as a fan as much. So that was super cool. Um, so here's what I'm hearing from the football community that they're really thinking that this latest lawsuit by Clemson against the SEC could bust the ACC up within months, not years. Can you tell me, can you give me exactly what this lawsuit is all about? You know, I did some looking on it, Dave, and I mean, what we're looking at is a situation where contractually Clemson had obligated themselves in a contract, basically, for rights with the ACC. Well, we've seen kind of what's going on with the Big Ten and the SEC. And if you look at, you know, the big, if you will, college football playoff packages, things of that nature. I mean, anytime there's money involved, you got to follow the money. And there is a penalty or a buyout clause that Clemson agreed to when Clemson executed the documents with the ACC. So what you've got is a conference that has uh, contracted with a member institution, in this case, Clemson. And, you know, you've got Clemson saying, hey, the fees to basically break the contract are exorbitant and we want out. But then when you kind of look at the root of what all the problem is, I mean, it, it all boils down to money. And it boils down to basically certain conferences have adapted and changed with the times and others have sort of, I guess, been lulled into a sense of complacency. I sort of equate it to what I would consider the uh, film uh, digital transition. You know, we all had cameras and we all use film and that's all well and good. But, you know, all of these places that just relied and didn't make the digital transformation, uh, I mean, they're no longer relevant. They're no longer in business except for just sort of a niche following. And so, I don't want to necessarily say the ACC has become a niche conference, but the reality of it is they're they're no longer anywhere close to the 800-pound gorilla that perhaps they were in days past. So, Counselor, as far as Clemson's legal argument, though, um, can they say that the ACC is in a breach of contract by not trying to keep up and not looking out for them because it isn't part of the contract? They have to look out for the best interests of their member institutions? Yeah, I mean, I think they can articulate that, Caleb. I just don't know whether or not, you know, a judge is going to buy into that. You know, obviously the emotion, and if we listen to the echo bubble over there at Clemson, everybody's like, heck yeah, we got taken advantage of, you know, we want to, you know, out of this contract. But, you know, when grown adults represented by competent legal counsel execute contracts, then you, you end up in a situation where you have to have what's going to be articulated as a material breach. You know, there is not a law against making bad agreements. It's just a set of circumstances that, you know, is the judge going to buy that it constitutes a breach? It just seems to me that's hard to get out of. But I, I hear again from the football community that they think it will, that Clemson's plan will work. But it's like, I just don't understand how you could sign a contract and just say, I suddenly don't think it's fair. You're the one that signed it, right? Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I think it, it, it's grossly distinct from the circumstances that, of course, Tennessee in dealing with the NIL and the NCAA, that's not a situation where, you know, you're looking at a just, I want out of the contract. It's a situation where you had that overreach. In this particular situation, and I was looking at when they uh, basically renewed the contract, and I, you know, they have executed that contract the last, and I'm, I'm looking sort of online at the same time at my computer. Uh, they re signed it uh, in 2013 voluntarily, and then subsequently uh, 2016, and it's binding through 2036. So, you know, the reason that they put these penalty clauses in these contracts is because there's justified reliance upon it. When the conference goes and does things, they do things so that they can beat their chest, so to speak, and say, hey, you know, we've got the Clemsons, you know, two-time recent national champions, 
uh, that are a member of our conference. Hence, you, we need all these, you know, media rights. We need money, so to speak. And I, I just, I, I think Clemson's got a hard road to hoe. I mean, uh, I, I don't, I don't necessarily want to uh, foreclose the possibility of a win, but you know, uh, it, it, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. So, uh, can you draw a distinction for me, real quick? Because uh, I'm, I'm curious if I, if this is a fair comparison or not. Um, we're all music fans, and I think we all know throughout history there are stories right. of artists. There are stories of artists signing really bad deals with record companies. They sue based on coercion, and then they kind of get out of the contract because it's kind of, I guess, the idea is they were coerced into signing a really bad deal. It could that somewhat apply to a school like Clemson or Florida State saying that the ACC coerced them into signing these contracts? What would be the difference between that and an artist who signs a bad deal with a record company that gets out of that deal? Well, it's kind of like Gallagher and the watermelon on that. I don't want to dish on Clemson too much, but you know what? Uh, us good old boys in Tennessee over here flipping our hamburgers, we, uh, I believe oh, we put, yeah. put, put, a, put a whipping on the boys a few years ago. But no, in all fairness, I think a lot of times when you look at what you're talking about, Caleb, uh, they're individuals that are not sophisticated, perhaps new to the industry. You know, a youngster coming out, they sign a bad deal. They're taken advantage of by somebody that's much more skilled and knowledgeable in the area. Uh, I think it's going to be somewhat disingenuous. I cannot imagine that they've not got a few lawyers over there in the Carolinas that are capable of understanding contracts and that, you know, they were represented by competent legal counsel. I mean, what are they going to say? Hey, our, our, our boys and gals weren't as smart as y'all's boys and gals. It's not, you know, the young athlete, you know, perhaps, you know, the major league ball player, you know, back in the day that gets, you know, uh, signed to, you know, some sort of minuscule contract and they're just trying to hold them to it. So I, I just, I, I think the judge is going to evaluate when you evaluate the breach as far as the sophistication of the respective parties and what they were entering into and if it made sense at the time, just because it made sense at the time, you know, as time changes, maybe it turns out to be kind of a bad deal, but you still execute it. And I, I don't know what they're thinking, executing an agreement for 20 years. I mean, a lot changes uh, in 20 years. I mean, a lot. That's, a, that's an awful long time, right? And I've sent a couple of kids to college in, in 20 years. Uh, T Scott, great stuff. How's your how's your bracket? Let's pull up where your bracket is. As a matter of fact, you you want? Oh my God, no! Oh I got destroyed. Oh <laughs> I, was my like, God. I was like, you know, could we have a competition for the worst bracket? Because I I may be I may be running a solid hard bracket, but I did I did, and I, I'll let you pull. It. I did want my volunteers going all the way, which we we are alive and well, so perhaps sure. there's a salvage. Sure, absolutely. Well, let's see how you did. All right, so <laughs> All right, let's, pull, let's pull it up right here. Um, Caleb, use your young eyes, or I, I can. So we've got uh, – my wife's already been eliminated, by the way. Former Tennessee punter David Leverton is the highest-ranking celebrity. Former safety Fred White right behind him. We got Jimmy Himes in there, John Adams. Uh, John Pennington of the Sports Source that you can listen to Sundays on WATE. I'm still looking for T. Scott. Oh, there's T. Scott. Uh, there you go. See, you're, that's not bad. You're tied for six. I didn't categorize this correctly. So let me go back and fix this. Okay, so you're tied for sixth place. So you've got a great opportunity of, of winning this thing. <laughs> well, you know what they say about a blind squirrel? Even a blind squirrel finds a few nuts, but uh... – you know, my one of my my very dearest friends is a Kentucky fan, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to say I necessarily uh, relish in those Kentucky losses, but I might have sent a text or two, so or eight. 